And who would have thought that a bunch of people who signed up to study giant atomic powered monsters would be a little bit more open minded about it? Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in episode four of Monarch Legacy of Monsters. And guys, I gotta say, I'm loving the intrigue of this show. As soon as I figure out one mystery, another one just pops up, and I have to keep coming back for more. So let's break this down and tell you all of our theories on what's actually going on here. I have a theory. We open in Utah 2015, and just to really ground us in that year, Barnes is listening to the hit Anaconda by Nicki Minaj. Oh my gosh. Look at her. Now, there's no titans in Utah, but Utah is known for its dearth of dinosaur fossils, so I bet that's why the showrunners chose it. We get a close-up of the book Neuromancer by William Gibson, one of the first cyberpunk novels, and we also see this Armageddon energy drink in the back. Now, this is probably a play on monster energy, get it? Plus, the definition of Armageddon is the site or time of a final and conclusive battle between the forces of good and evil, which describes the final fight of every Monsterverse movie. Barnes runs inside when she hears one of her machines beeping, but her computers are all normal. This entire series has been about people in the present using technologies of the past. Think of Bill Randa's old notes hidden on tapes, or how the group flew to Alaska on a vintage plane. So it's actually a perfect touch that her computers fail to alert her to the gamma radiation, but this antique device does. Now on her bookshelf, we see other science fiction books like Kingdom of Cages by Sarah Zettel and Zero History, also by William Gibson. Also, we officially have a new outpost number, Outpost 47. Barnes. Outpost 47. We cut back to exactly where episode 3 left off, with the new Titan destroying the plane. Kentaro shoots a flare at him, but misses. He doesn't know it at the time, but the distraction of the heat is the best thing he could have done. Then we get the opening credits. Now look, if you want a shot-by-shot -shot breakdown, I did that in our first video, but I'm going to go over a few new things that we found. This doubled picture of Hiroshi is the exact picture we see in Kentaro's art piece. Now I never noticed before that one side has digital lines, while the other has a slight grain, which fits perfectly with the theme of digital versus analog. Also, this blue light breaking through the ice is the same light we see at the end of this episode. I have some theories about what's down there that I'll get to a little bit later. Once again, the director is Julian Holmes, who's also worked on Daredevil and The Boys. Now, of course, this episode also features one of the characters getting snowburn. And I'll tell you guys what would have really helped them with that snowburn, using moisturizer. Is that what you're putting on your face? Yeah, partly. I mean, this has all been part of my daily skincare routine. But I thought skincare was only for women. Oh yeah, I did too for a long time. Like I never use skincare at all. But then I worked outside for a lot of years. I noticed my skin was cracking. I got sunburned easier and I was starting to age like really fast. So I wanted to start using some kind of skincare, but like it's incredibly daunting, scary even. But geology makes skincare easy to understand. That's why we partner with them for this video. A good daily skincare routine can help you fight acne, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy eyes, and just overall, it makes your skin feel great. Like once I started the skincare routine, I rarely break out anymore and my skin's not oily or cracked. It's just been fantastic and it smells great. Plus, I mean, you look amazing. <laughs> you. But like I said, what I appreciate the most is how they make this so easy. You take a quiz on geology site and then their team of dermatologists customize this routine for you. Plus they send you these cards which explain each step, they show you how much to use and exactly what it does for you. Now earlier I did step one, everyday face wash, and step two, eye cream for dark circles. Then I did night cream for bedtime and this one is moisturizing morning cream. Plus you can eat it. No, 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 no. You, you can't eat it. Don't eat it. But I will say that skincare is very important. Geology has more than 7,000 five-star reviews. They've won 26 awards with ingredients that deliver real results. Right now, for a limited time, they're offering an amazing deal. If you use my code or scan this QR code, Geology will give you 70% off your skincare trial set. And on top of that, you get an additional bonus offer of up to 50% off one of the skin, hair, or body add-on products when you add it to your trial purchase. I recommend the deodorant and the body wash. It smells amazing. Now, back to what I was saying. We cut back to the group hiding from the Titan when May is laying in the snow, and you can see that she's wearing a military jacket. Now, I assume they all got their clothes from Duho, but remember, May had a bag. It's how she had her multiple passports. I have my passport. So maybe this jacket is hers and gives us hints about her real life. In episode two, I pointed out how these could be diplomatic passports, so maybe she's actually military, working for another government or agency. We flash back to Kentaro's art show in 2014, which includes giant masks with digital digital projections. Now, I assume that Kentaro had a better relationship with his father than Kate because he was defensive of his father. But right after Hiroshi's face flashes on the mask, Kentaro says, 
These masks are Kentaro's own works, so it implies that he knew his father was hiding something from him. We also see it flash to Kentaro's face for just a second, implying that he is wearing a metaphorical mask too. We all wear masks, metaphorically speaking. I also love this shot of Kentaro surrounded by these giant face sculptures. This entire show, we've seen titans that are literally larger than life. But in this shot, we see how people, people they thought they knew or didn't know at all, loom just as large. Kentaro's mom walks in and reads off the description of his art show. Parallels and Interiors is also the name of this week's episode, and it's so fitting when you consider Kate and Kentaro together, only children of parallel families living on almost the opposite sides of the world. And their interior life is actively challenged by all this new information. The fact that their dad had two families, the fact that he hunted monsters, and the fact that he had an uncle figure that he never told them about. We get another glimpse of Kentaro and Hiroshi's relationship when he says, <laughs> Now we've heard a lot about Kate's relationship and how she felt that he was never there. I thought that he had just sidelined Kate, but at least he treated his family equally. And then we see the poster for his exhibit, and I got so excited because this was on Monarch Unlocked. If you look at the background, you can even see the photo was taken at the exact same place. Now, the poster itself contains three images. The first is the base image of a human-like mask. The second image is the characters on the left side, and that's a traditional no mask. The third is Kentaro himself, masked in the characters on the right side. In the bottom right corner, there's also a small series of masks emblematic of both the theme and Kentaro's art style. And the bottom description reads, in both Japanese and English, it is said that facial expression reflects the heart. But is that so? The emotions behind the mask actually may be the exact opposite. Isn't the human mind understood not only by the vision, but also by knowing the individual deeply? Not only joy, sadness, anger, surprise, fear, disgust, but also admiration, worship, impatience, awe, embarrassment, boredom. This time, I want to stare at the other side of all those possible facial expressions that I create with digital art. You might see the real feelings. In the safe space of his art, Kentaro is almost admitting that he doesn't really know his father and that nobody really knows him. But also think of this photo in the context of Monarch Unlocked. His poster has no reason to be there unless Monarch was already watching him. Remember, this is in 2014 before Kentaro knew anything about his father or even before Godzilla attacked. So there might have been a bigger reason Monarch was already surveilling him. May walks by just as he snaps a photo of his poster and she's not happy to be on camera. <laughs> Kentaro and May have this little meet cute and notice how they're both running from something. Given what we know about May, it's obvious that her sketchy past is why she doesn't want her photo taken. But also, the first thing she asks about is alcohol. Is there wine? Why does my body crave alcohol? So she may be using alcohol to run from her emotions, and Kentaro is running too, from his own nerves and feelings of inadequacy. Look at how fast he finds a reason to leave. I know a place. Now? But don't you have a show? Kentaro tells May to trust him as he leads her to a secret bar, and this parallels the situation in 2015. In Alaska, May says, Are you happy we came? Showing her regret for ever trusting him in the first place. They go into the bar where Kentaro reveals, Okay, so you're a successful artist. I designed the lighting. I imagine the lighting also includes the hanging bird sculptures because of how this shot focuses on them. These birds are a callback to the Titan in episode two, the first monster his grandparents ever discovered. Also, this backdrop behind the bar looks like sonar radar, a tool used to hunt titans. Kentaro says, I'm letting the suspense build. It's all part of the act. Just like his work, his outward presentation isn't true. It is just a mask. When May asks if taking her out was an act, he brings her to his home, aka the interior and true part of himself. And Kentaro's room is filled with masks, both physical masks like we see here and drawings of masks. Unlike his ultra modern work in the gallery, many of these masks are in the traditional Japanese style like Oni masks, Hayatoko masks, and Tengu masks. After Kentaro says the art gallery took a chance on him, May says, Come on, that's bullshit. People don't give other people a shot unless there's something in it for them. Now, while it might sound like a cynical worldview, it also reveals more about May's intentions. She happily walks off to a bar with someone she just met, and from Monarch Unlocked, we know that Monarch was already surveilling him. So, could she be spying for Monarch? We cut back to Alaska 2015, where in the distance, Kate sees a glowing blue light. Now, this blue light matches Godzilla's atomic breath, so I'm pretty sure this is radiation from a Titan. Over at Monarch HQ in Virginia, Barnes explains there's pulsar activity in Alaska. Look at the monitor here compared to the one we see on Monarch Unlocked. Now, this is important because the Mudo in Godzilla also gave off pulsars, as did Godzilla himself. The last time anyone saw readings like this was right before the last emergence event. Oh! <laughs> 
We also see Godzilla do this in King of the Monsters as an intimidation tactic. Hey, what's with the light show? It's an intimidation display. Does that mean? Yep, the Titan they've seen, that's nothing. Something much, much bigger is about to emerge. In the snow, he starts hearing voices. Oh, was he going crazy? Well, it's possible. I know being stranded out there would drive me nuts, but Shaw says, uh, Titans have odd effects on their surroundings and how we experience them. If the Titans are messing with time, then he could be hearing echoes of the past. Kate and Shaw are carrying May at this point, but she refuses to let Shaw carry the bag of Monarch files for her. This is because she's scared that he'll leave her, or both of them, if he has the files and doesn't need them anymore. Come on, man, let me carry that bag. No, stop, no. He wants something. They end up back at Hiroshi's tent, and Shaw says, This place is stranger than you think. Now, I think this might be the key to show how Shaw's lived so long, but more on that in just a bit. Kate refuses to leave May and forces them to go back to the camp. Remember, Kate's entire bus full of kids died on G-Day, and she said to do ho, Not so much when you see other people lose theirs. She refuses to have more survivor guilt. We are not losing another person. We switch back to the 2014 flashback. Kentaro says, You haven't told me shit about yourself. Now he's shown her his true self, but May remains distant, which supports the theory that she's actually spying on him. Now she does mention she's from Tacoma, and look, I don't know if this is on purpose, but Toyota has a camper called the Tacozilla, which is a larger version of the Toyota Tacoma. Wow, what a special car. Also, when she sits up, there's a drawing of a Hanya mask behind her. Now, in Japanese theater tradition, the Hanya mask is used to depict a woman that's possessed by a demon or even just a villainous woman in general. May gets a call from Lyra, who's her sister. I also bet that's who she was talking to on the ferry. And notice that when she's on the phone with her, she's only framed by the dirty window, signaling that she isn't transparent about who she is or her motives. She also uses the line, I'm traveling for work, yeah which is the same excuse Hiroshi gave to Kentaro and Kate. We go back to Alaska 2015, where May tells Kate to call Lyra if anything happens to her. Now, even though they dated, May never told Kentaro about her sister, which is proven when she says, No, he doesn't know shit. And guess who else kept family members secret? Hiroshi. But if she's working for Monarch, why does she seem so unprepared for all this stuff? Well, like she said, she worked in computer shit. Just because she works for them doesn't mean that she was a field agent. After all, Shaw himself said Monarch became data-driven. So maybe she was one of the people who was interpreting data. The Titan returns and goes straight for the fire, confirming my theory that the Titan is pulling the thermal radiation from heat sources. Nerd. He looks a lot bigger than before. He might be. Godzilla got bigger after they gave him some nuclear bomb medicine in King of the Monsters. It could be that this Titan is swelling in size now that there's access to radiation. Back in Virginia, Monarch shares the gamma radiation readings, and notice that the army general is quick to say, Call it what it was, an attack while the scientists prefer to refer to it as an event. Now, going back all the way to the 1954 movie, there is tension between the military, who see the Titans only as a threat, and the scientists, who see them as a marvel. In fact, after this time period, Monarch actually undergoes Senate hearings to decide if they should become a military branch for this exact reason. And Tim makes a return. He is gunning for Bill Randa's files. Most people dismiss Bill's theories as insane, but Tim says, And I would have thought that a bunch of people who signed up to study giant atomic powered monsters, be a little bit more open-minded about it. Which mirrors what Bill said to Shaw and Keiko in the last episode. It requires open minds. Back in Alaska, Shaw devises a plan to kill the Titan and says, Gonna light this thing brighter than Times Square on VJ Day. Jeez, how old is he? We have a theory. So last week we said that it could be some type of monarch experiment. And while that's still a possibility, there might be a simpler explanation. Remember how he said to Kate that Titans mess with the surrounding landscape? Well, another place that's true is Skull Island. In Kong, Hank Marlowe even said, Some of them don't even seem to age. Now we know that Bill Randa died on the Kong expedition and that Shaw did not believe Monarch's version of the events. This whole thing sucks. I mean so what if he went to Skull Island to look for Bill and got trapped by the storm? Being on the island could slow down the aging process, which explains why he looks and acts so much younger than he is. We switch over to Kentaro's perspective, who jumps up from the snow when he hears his dad's voice. Then he sees an apparition of him. Boy, he's really losing it. Maybe, but notice that Hiroshi is wearing the same clothes that he visited Kaden after G-Day, which presumably Kentaro never saw. That's f***ing interesting, man. That's Interesting. Now, of course, it could just be a common outfit for him, but like I said, the environment's affected by the Titans. Maybe it is an echo from when he was there. But then, Kentaro sure starts hallucinating when he sees the art gallery overlaid on top of the radio post. Don't you know I'm local? 
As he walks in, we see a series of faces flickering across the sculptures, including a no mask and Hiroshi. As Kentaro imagines his father, we find out that Kentaro wasn't being defensive of his dad because he treated him better than Kate, but because of his own guilt. <laughs> This creates another parallel between Kate and Kentaro. They're both dealing with survivor's guilt. Also, notice how he says, Now that explains how Kentaro went from the art show in 2014 to a corporate suit in 2015. He finally comes to when he hears the sound of radio static and looks at how dilapidated the radio shack is. The doors open, the windows are blown out, and the phone's even off the ringer. Now we know Hiroshi was there recently because of the pencil shavings, so I think that the ice titan tracked him there too, and then he had to flee in a hurry. Shaw, May, and Kate light a giant fire for the Titan and Kentaro comes in on a helicopter just in time to save them. But as they leave, they see this giant hole in the ground glowing with radiation. Nah, it's probably nothing. I think there's going to be an entire ecosystem down there. Remember, Hiroshi's notes said major fauna, implying there's plant life. And the Titans are already messing with the environment, so maybe they crafted a perfect ecosystem for themselves below ground. They ride off to safety with May and a stretcher hooked up to an IV, which reminded me of Ford and Joe riding off from Japan after the Mudo hatch. And then Kate says, I never thought I'd thank someone for abandoning their family, but here we are. It seems small, but notice that she's finally identifying him as her family, not just her father's second life. <laughs> You're my brother. Earlier in the episode, she even calls him brother to May instead of just Kentaro. Because my brother tried saving her asses by shooting a flare at it. Kentaro's art show was about identity, and together, their identities change. They aren't just Hiroshi's children, but actual siblings. It's actually really touching to finally see this family come together. I mean, oh my god, it's Tim! It's Tim! Oh my god. It looks like next week, we will finally figure out Tim and Shaw's history. So, that's everything we caught in this episode. Did you see something we missed? Are you happy to learn more about Kentaro? Does May work for Monarch? Big shout out to the writer of this video, Miss Brianna McLarty. You can find her socials and mine listed below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. You know, people are always talking about how Godzilla represents like the Japanese trauma and trying to deal with the atomic bomb. Nobody ever talks about what Mecha Godzilla represents. So I always thought that Mecha Godzilla represented the institution of Godzilla as a film and franchise. Godzilla is constantly trying to fight against this artificial form of himself, which is not true to the concept of the original film.